Oh, thank you very much, and thank you all very much for, for giving up an evening in the sunshine to spend um, an hour or so uh, discussing and debating whether it's time to reimagine garden cities for the 21st century. I um, run the, the Town and Country Planning Association. I'm sure many of you know the TCPA, but I just wanted to, to start by saying where we come from, and we absolutely come from the garden city movement. We were founded by Ebenezer Howard in... 1899 and at that point in time we were dealing with um, very high overcrowding in cities, poor sanitation, high unemployment, overcrowding and at the same time we had low wages and social isolation in our rural areas and Ebenezer Howard brought forward the, the garden city idea that the marrying of town and country getting the best of both and he was, he was bringing forward garden cities at a time where we didn't have the MPPF, we didn't have the 1947 Planning Act. You absolutely had to make the case on, on the merits of cost, of viability, of durability, of, of social sustainability. And the language he was talking then resonates absolutely to the circumstances we, we find ourselves in now. But what I really want to do in the next sort of 20 minutes or so is, is talk about the story of the last 12 months. It's been an absolutely extraordinary 12 months in terms of planning reform, probably the most profound changes to the planning system for, for 60 years. And during this transition with the Localism Act and the MPPF and the front page of the Telegraph being about concreting over the countryside day in, day out, um, there were other things happening and we were really keen to start making the case for holistically planned growth in areas that are, are, are looking at this in a way that is holistic, is sustainable, but also starting to make the case politically and cross-party. So in June of last year, we published a report called Reimagining Garden Cities for the 21st Century. And when we published that report, we didn't yet have, we had the localism bill being debated, but we didn't have a localism act, and we hadn't seen the MPPF yet. But what we did know is there was financial retrenchment, there was stigma attached with large-scale development. Many of the sites across the country were stuck. And we thought it was time to look back to the garden cities, but also to look at the new towns and some contemporary examples, and look at, at, at what we could do to start rebuilding the case. The case for linking for jobs and homes, the case for creating economies of scale, the case for tapping in potentially to the enterprise agenda with um, local enterprise partnerships, if, and if they, there's a big if there, but if they are looking at growth, surely they should be looking at homes and communities alongside infrastructure and investment. So we, we, we published this report, and soon after, in September, we had a response from Grant Shapps, the housing minister. And in that response, um, amazingly, it was in, it was in the, the Guardian Housing Network, amazingly, Grant Shapps said, the scale of, the house, of housing need that we now face means that we need the most imaginative proposals to come forward, which get us back to Howard's original ideals. And what he said in that was that it wouldn't be down to government to bring this forward, it would be down to the sector. And he invited the TCPA to bring together a group of people to start a discussion on how we might start making the case for, for garden cities today. And that's about how do we build on, on the government's absolute commitment to localism, neighbourhood planning, community rights, and we, we can discuss that and, and, and whether there's a role for that in, in new garden cities but also in, in the way that the garden cities were brought forward by pioneers and entrepreneurs. It was, it was philanthropic entrepreneurs that, that had the vision of place, and how could we capture that, have that strong sense of vision, and, and bring communities with us. So that was September, Grant Shapps passed the challenge to us, and then in November, the housing strategy was, was published. And in the housing strategy on page 10, there was an acknowledgement of locally planned large-scale development. The first acknowledgement of scale and the first thing the government had said about housing in the medium to long term. And what that, that said is that sometimes the supply of new homes can be best achieved through large-scale, comprehensively planned new development, whether urban extensions or new settlements. And, and it talked about the great sort of thinking that, that British planners had done in terms of contributing to that debate. What government set out in the housing strategy was, was a couple of things. Nothing concrete, and, and certainly with a name like locally planned large-scale development, it didn't get much press coverage. But what it did do um, was set out that government were going to look at how they could bring this forward this year, and that was through simplified planning, through potentially supporting some localities. But they also said that they'd look at, at, at 
prioritising spending for large scale through future CSR. So um, that is something that is going to be coming this way in the not too distant future. And then in March, uh, momentum gathered a bit, bit faster than we thought it was going to. On the, the 19th of March, I think it was, um, the Prime Minister did a speech on infrastructure. And in that speech was a statement saying that the government were going to consult on plans for a new generation of, of garden cities. Now, up until that point, the government's language hadn't been around garden cities. And it was the first time um, that, that the Prime Minister has, has perhaps been interested, or a serving Prime Minister has been interested in garden cities for, for a fair few decades. And the press coverage, the response to that, was actually really quite positive. Um, I mean, things will always change when, when locations are mentioned. But actually, the feeling it evoked, the way he talked about it, evoked an image of place where people might want to live. And government haven't had a narrative on that, a really strong narrative on the types of places we want to create for quite a long time. The following week, the National Planning Policy Framework was, was published. And in that is the most important hook. On page 13, paragraph 52, um, was a new paragraph, and that's again said sometimes the way of delivering housing that large scale through different models, extensions, new villages, new towns, might be a suitable option, and that option becomes available to local authorities. But importantly to us, it said bringing forward those large scale sites in accordance to the principles of the garden cities. So that uh, laid a very strong foundation for the work we were doing. And at that point, we'd already set up um, an expert group to look at, at some of the challenges and the barriers to bringing forward garden cities. But it gave us a very strong foundation for our work. And then in April of this year, we republished Raymond Unwin's 1912 pamphlet, Nothing Gained by Overcrowding. And we, we did a parliamentary debate with the launch of that. And um, there's copies here today. And if, if you haven't had a chance to pick one up, give me your, your email address, your card, and I will post one to you or email you a PDF if you prefer. But what that, that publication does and what Unwin did a century ago is, as well as being very visionary, the Garden City pioneers were pragmatists. They were practical. They had to make a business case for creating these types of places. And the, the forward of that publication, um, Professor P Sir Peter Hall, who's our president, sets out the maths and the case that, that Unwin was trying to make. And it, it was simply that by planning simply, by planning gardens at the back and planning out roads, you benefit the landowner, you benefit the developer, and ultimately you benefit the resident in terms of, of quality of life, the sense of place. And, and the economics of it. And Patrick Clark, who's going to be talking after me, will work with us on this publication and will be uh, talking about everything to be gained by looking at these design and layout principles today. I'm going to then talk about the new report, but before I do, I wanted to really just spend a minute saying, why, why are we doing this? And I think it's very important that we recognize that we need more housing, better quality housing, more sustainable housing, greener housing. Many young people want somewhere affordable to live, somewhere affordable to bring up a family. Many of the older generation want somewhere to downsize. They need a sustainable local alternative. Where do they find it? People want to live in positive, healthy environments. They want to live in places that make them feel good. They want to have access to the natural environment. But alongside providing homes, we have to provide jobs. We need to support a low carbon economy and we need to find the right locations in order to deliver this. So our case for, for new garden cities, and this is as part of a portfolio of solutions, it's not at the expense of regenerating our towns and cities, it's not at the expense of investing in the capital, of, of looking at Liverpool and making that vibrant and sustainable. It's in addition. So firstly, we think large scale new communities are part of that solution. We cannot meet the housing crisis on a plot-by-plot -plot basis. We just, it simply will not deliver enough homes to meet the nation's needs. I think, secondly, there's a huge opportunity of planning at scale. In the words of, of Unwin, uh, one of the Garden City pioneers, it's about a more har harmonious combination of city and country, dwelling house and garden. We're talking about the exact opposite to Bolton Estates. We're talking about holistically planning a community where you design in your neighborhood so you can walk to school, where your streets are tree-lined, where you, you have access to growing your own food. And it's also about 
pioneering standards. They were pioneers a century ago. We can be pioneers today. It's not about sort of going back to the same type of design. It's saying let's be innovative and brilliant with design today. Let's do something that's within the grain of the landscape, yes. But let's actually be, be innovative in how we go about it. And I think thirdly, and very importantly in terms of uh, this government, is that the experience from the, both the garden cities and the new towns is that if they're properly managed and underwritten by the, the capture of land value, they can be good for business and society. And that business case is hugely important, but it's taking a very long-term patient approach. So um, I, I thought it was important to set out the garden city principles, because if a, if a coalition government is talking about them, um, somebody needs to articulate them. And in an era where we've moved away from national guidance and national prescription, we felt it was very important that if sites are going to be coming forward and using garden city principles as set out in the MPPF, that we at least start articulating them ourselves in terms of, of what they mean. I mean, in terms of, of, of the way that Howard articulated it, the advantages of the most energetic and active town life with all the beauty and delight of the country may be secured in perfect combination. And that's a great way of articulating a place. But actually, that there's a whole range of principles that the Garden City pioneers looked at. And they were around a strong vision, leadership, community engagement, the capture of land value for the benefit of the community, having a really decent mixed housing offer, mixed tenure, mixed design, affordable homes, healthy homes for ordinary working people. But it was also about imaginative, high-quality designs, combining the best of town and country, different styles, the arts and crafts movement. It was about really generous green space. You go to Hampstead Garden Suburb and you, you map the green space. I think it's about 63% green space. It feels healthy environment. Obviously, it's very, very affluent and desirable now, but it wasn't built in that way. It was built to be high-quality environment with a mix of housing. And if you walk around... Letchworth and Welling today, being able to see trees between houses, being able to see allotments being used, being able to see really beautiful tree-lined streets. We can do all of this. We have this brilliant tradition in planning in this country, yet so often we fail to do so. And these are, are the Garden City principles. So things like having the opportunity to grow your own food, having a strong cultural and recreational opportunity. I mean, the, the Garden City pioneers perhaps didn't necessarily plan from that right at the beginning, but things like the Amateur Dramatic Society, the Cooperative Local Shop, the Howard Stores in, in Welland, these, these things emerged and they nourished them and they supported them and they invested in the community and the models that brought them forward. And it was also about walkable neighbourhoods, integrated transport and the social city model being that, that places are linked up. So we, we went on to, to publish the report, and I think before talking about this report, and um, you'll see in the back it was, it was developed with a, a, a group of practitioners, of landowners, developers, house builders, representatives from Welland, Letchworth and Bourneville. And, and what that, that group really did is, is starting by understanding the critical issues, and those critical issues are absolutely about delivery and they're absolutely about partnership. And I think they, they also um, very much learned about how gar Garden City is being private sector led and New Towns being state led and how actually we need to find the best of, of both of those models in, in order to bring them forward and work within the grain of this government, but also challenge the government somewhat to, to make this happen. So while there's no sort of silver bullet solution to unlocking garden cities and suburbs today, the expert group identified five key principal areas where action was needed in order to, to start to unlock the potential of, of new garden cities. And I think first and foremost was vision, leadership and governance. And when looking um, at, at the Garden City Pioneers, it, it's, it's that, that really strong vision. When you walk around well in today, you see what they were trying to create, and people buy into that vision now. Having that integrity of place, that integrity of vision, but flexibility about how you deliver it was absolutely key. So in this report, un, un, under this section, there was a number of recommendations, but we started off with the very first one, the MPPF mentioning Garden City principles if we want to see garden cities today, then we need government to have a sustained, cross-party, long-term commitment to, to garden cities um, and to the principles, not necessarily duplicating the past, but actually building on those principles to create great places. We also need local authority leadership and advocacy. 
Without the support of the local authority, we are not going to see successful new places. And that is a big challenge. I mean, local authority political cycles run on a sort of a four-year basis. And a garden city is going to take 15, 20, 25, 30 years to create. And actually, the benefits of the place come at the end, the really high quality, the actual holistic finishing off the place when it's successful and thriving takes time. And the people who are going to benefit quite often are, are not even of voting age yet. And so how do, you, how do you embed that really strong commitment at the local authority level? Well, for us, it has to be through the local plan. The MPPF provides an opportunity for that. But we also need a radical culture change in the governance of new communities. We need to engage people before the first master plan is created. We need to provide opportunity for community buy-in, for having a real say, for being listened to as the community is coming forward. Having community development workers who are independent from the developer and the local authority who are appointed to meet and greet people, to be there to set up those, those civic organisations. And really importantly, there needs to be a long-term mechanism of governance and stewardship when the town's complete, when the town continues to thrive and grow. And if you look at the models of Letchworth, for example, Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation, that was founded as an industrial and provident society. The Heritage Foundation today provides so much for that community. It runs the healthcare centre, it runs a local minibus, it runs an ambulance, it runs an art centre, it runs a community hub which you can go and use for, for free. It's quite a, a, a unique model, but it's because they were able to keep, keep the freehold and, and get those rents in and they continue to invest in that local community. But we, we can build on those models of stewardship and governance and I think actually if we want to address the stigma attached to, to new developments, we need to ensure people have a say and feel part of it and have ownership of new places as they come forward. The second area is around unlocking land. And, and without unlocking land at the right price, in the right place, at the right time, we're not going to see this happening. And we are, of course, in, in difficult financial times. Um, but, but there is land out there. Now, one of the recommendations in the report, and there are many, but I'll just pick on one or two, is around the public sector land release opportunity. Government have, have announced that there's, they've released enough public sector land to deliver, I think it's 1,002 new homes um, in this parliamentary term at the moment. But government departments, they are all releasing land. However, that land has to be released at best value, which means best value to the Treasury, which means releasing it at the highest price to get the maximum receipts. But government have a decision here. What do they want to create? And what value do they want to create to the local economy as well as the national economy? And actually, there's a really strong case for releasing land at best value to the community, to society, to the building industry, to the, to the architecture and planning profession um, who are all part of this. And actually saying, well, on some of these sites, we want to do something more ambitious. We want to create new communities. And we're going to come up with different models of how we release the land. And we recognise that that won't give us maximum receipts, but it will create X number of local jobs. It will deliver on the housing that we need. It will create vibrant communities where people want to live and work and go to school. Um, in terms of, of, uh, of other models coming forward, because all of that public sector land is not the most desirable land. Some of it's in remote places. Some of it doesn't have the right supporting infrastructure. Where else can, can we bring forward garden cities and how could that happen? And in terms of unlocking land, the, the group, expert group, very much felt that um, a partnership approach was absolutely essential. So setting up a garden city joint venture or a, a garden city sort of local development agreement in terms of actually having that absolute partnership between the local authority and the landowner in order to bring sites forward. We also said, although not so popular among some of the, uh, the private sector developers who were on the expert group, because they have paid a lot for the land that they own, that if a local authority was ambitious and they wanted to bring forward a site and they couldn't get a partnership agreement, we do still have compulsory purchase powers. And actually compulsory purchase orders can be a very powerful way, one, of negotiating and, and secondly, of, of releasing that land at the right price so that you can capture the land value for the benefit of the community. And I think some local authorities would consider doing that today. The big challenge being is, is local authority capacity and skills because you cannot undertake this task without enthusiasm but also without real skills in, in, in order to do it properly and timely and successfully. 
The third area we looked at was investing in infrastructure and how do we get a new relationship between risk and reward. And this was probably the thing that the group debated most and, and, and the area where government, treasury, number 10 policy unit, DCRG are most interested at the moment. It's how do we de-risk this type of, of development? Because the private sector ultimately are going to have to put in a considerable amount of cash but in order to do so, there is a role for government in, in terms of de-risking the development. We came up with a number of, of ideas on this front. I think one of the, the, the ideas that certainly has traction is that local authorities to take a bigger share of the risk and to borrow. Now, we have the community infrastructure levy and local authorities, um, we thought, until we, we delved into it, we thought local authorities could borrow against, potentially borrow against SIL. They can't yet, but government have a choice as to whether they want to enable it. Similarly, new homes bonus. If you're delivering large-scale new sites and you're going to get the council tax receipts for six years on 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 homes, that is a substantial income. You could prudentially borrow against that. However, would you take the risk with a government that's sort of halfway through its first term? In order for local authorities to take that risk, government need to, to, to give some kind of guarantee to the new homes bonus so, so that local authorities would have the confidence to borrow. But we also need different types of investment vehicles. If you look at the Dutch models of investment, they provide very long-term, low-cost loans, loans over a 15, 20-year period, and the money is paid back. We don't have that type of lending facility here. And we could do it. We could do it with the Green Investment Bank. We could do it with a, a Garden City Investment Bank. Perhaps not called that, but a national vehicle that provides that type of loan facility over a long-term period. Um, but the, the rewards really highly sustainable places that meet the Garden City principles. Now, if, if the public sector is going to take a greater financial risk, if they're going to meet some of this, this infrastructure investment cost, a greater proportion of it, then I think that the landowners can be expected to take a more reasonable, patient approach to, to the, their return on investment. So by sh demonstrating a willingness to share risk from the public sector, the private sector could also be expected to do so, in return for certainty. And I think that, that a number of the people on the expert group really felt that actually if they could get certainty, they would be quite happy to be, be part of creating a new community over that 20, 25 year time horizon. There are developers, there are landowners, there are major housing associations out there that find this model very attractive. But there needs to be a partnership approach in order to de-risk it. And then I think in terms of investment, there also needs to be a role for the community. How can we get the communities to have a, a bigger stake in their places? Is there a way that you could set up a model where you have a cooperative ownership of, of part of your new garden city? Could financial models be set up that way? The fourth area we looked at was planning. And the, the planning approach of, of the Garden City Pioneers was really revolutionary, and, and we see it replicated across, across the world today. And that was a pr an approach where we looked at employment, design, green infrastructure, sustainability, innovation, self-built, high-quality design, but looking at place in a holistic sense, trying to cater for everyone, the mix of housing, understanding the sense of, of, of place, your walkable neighbourhoods, and actually getting back to that holistic but flexible approach to planning is something that we absolutely can do now. However, I, I do have to mention planning reform, and one of the big elements of, of the Localism Act was the, the powers of the Secretary of State to revoke the regional strategies. We are now the only country in Northwest Europe without a national or strategic tier of planning. It is all down to the local level. And in some areas, it will mean that they can deliver new garden cities, new, new, new settlements. Places like North Stowe in Cambridgeshire, where you have a partnership between the County Council, South Cambridge District Council, and the City Council. And North Stowe, it, which will eventually be a, a, a new settlement of, of 10,000 homes, is actually meeting the housing need of the city. It's enabling the city to, to, to thrive by, by providing quality environment for that local community. But that hasn't been without its challenges. It's taken a long time. But the partnership approach between the three authorities, the county, the district, and the city, has been absolutely vital. Not without its political challenges, but it's a real example of, of places working together. However, I'm, I'm sure many of you all have had the experience of, of local authorities not working together. So in, in replace of a, of a regional tier of planning, which was politically very difficult and it wasn't democratically accountable, 
But actually, it was politically quite useful if you could blame somebody else for the numbers. Now the numbers have to be agreed locally. And the new mechanism, the duty to cooperate between local authorities, they must engage actively, constructively, and on an ongoing basis, doesn't actually provide a duty to agree. So if you look at somewhere like Cambridgeshire, it's a thriving economic hub. Sorry, not Cambridgeshire, I meant Stevenage. A thriving um, economic hub. You look at Stevenage, and Stevenage actually of, of, of places at the moment. It's a, its local economy is really not doing badly. It's doing pretty well relative to the rest of the country. But Stevenage can't meet its local housing need within its local authority boundary. It needs to cooperate with its neighbour, and its neighbour says, no, I don't want the houses in its local area. So Stevenage's local plan is found unsound. I'm not quite sure where Stevenage goes for here. They try and revise their plan, but actually they can't physically meet their local housing need within the confines of their local authority area. And that's, that's going to be a big challenge, and it's something that we urge government to look at. Um, also on planning, though, I think there was a really exciting opportunity here for, for community planners and builders. One of the things that, that has been brought through with the Localism Act is a whole set of, of community rights, community rights to run assets, um, a whole set of rights, community rights to build, community land trusts. And there's also a big emphasis at the moment politically on self-build. Now, whatever you think of, of the coalition's policies, actually, when you're planning a, a large-scale site, the opportunity to, to use some of these models becomes much greater. One of the things that Welland did is it, it had a site for self-build. Now, if you go there today, you wouldn't necessarily know that that particular um, section of the master plan had been for self-build because uh, the drawings all had to go past Louis de Sisson's desk, and they're quite ingrained um, in keeping with the rest of the buildings. But nevertheless, they wanted to pioneer those options, and absolutely one of the things we should be looking at in terms of bringing forward sites is different models of getting people involved in, in their community, in ownership, in different ways, in ways that they do it in the Netherlands with, with such ambition and, and vigour at such a scale um, that actually if we could, we could take just a bit of that, it would be hugely successful. And the final area here is on skills coordination and delivery. And one of the very strong messages from the expert group that came back was just how difficult it is to deal with the multiple consents regimes. Now, it isn't to say that we shouldn't have strategic environment assessment. We absolutely should. It isn't to say that we shouldn't have negotiations with the Highways Agency, with the Environment Agency, with Natural England, English Heritage. Absolutely. But they all work on different timescales. It's difficult to work out who the right person is. And actually, one very important role that, that government could fulfill is providing a, a one-stop shop aligning those consent regimes, but also, more importantly, getting the people in the room at the same time and having a positive dialogue about what you're trying to create and, and the barriers and issues that you're, you're, you're coming up against. And then there's the issue of, of our local authority planners and our local authority councillors. And I think there is, there is a, a, it's been a, a, a difficult 18 months, two years in, in local government. There's been a lot of change. There's been substantial cuts. There's been a huge amount of pressure and there's been a radical reform of planning. But this is a real opportunity to reinvigorate planners. We need to inspire the planning profession to actually remember its heritage and its roots and what planning can do. We need planners to stop being fixated on development control and to go out there and be visionary, to actually see place to talk to people. And um, we need to, to have that culture change, and I think that that culture change needs to come internally and externally from, from the people dealing with local authorities. But that will not happen without substantial training and support, and it's a really difficult time for local authorities, and in particular for the large-scale sites. In most places, we have lost the skills in local government to deal with the project management of, of a new community, to deal with the financial management, to deal with the infrastructure investment, and in particular to deal with the negotiation of the infrastructure investment, which becomes all the more critical when, when local authorities are, are going to have to work out how they take their share. So I think it's a challenge, it's an opportunity, and it's something we are absolutely pressing back to government, and we are also working with local authorities about, and the, the new report is about to go out to all local authorities in the country with an offer of, of coming to talk to us and, and to see whether we can get government, if they're committed to this agenda, to actually give some extra support to those local authorities that want to do it. So I just want to end by saying that we are presented with a really unique opportunity at the moment. We can shape the future of, of, of our nation. And I also think there is absolutely no doubt we'll build more homes.
But I think the challenge is, is whether we have the determination to leave future generations with a legacy of beauty and durability, which truly meets the challenges of the 21st century. The report that, that I hope you've got a copy of sets out a really clear call for action to renew our commitment to building outstanding, inclusive and resilient places. And those are the places that would truly meet the, the accolade of Garden City. And I don't think we should accept anything less. Thank you.